Hi, uh, I'm Ron Dolan. I uh, teach a class here at the law school called Law 2.0, uh, Technology's Impact on the Practice of Law. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the way that innovation uh, and legal technology works in a big law context, both uh, in-house um, uh, in -house departments, law firms, and even alternate service providers. Um, I, uh, I have a background in computer science, uh, and I got a law degree after I retired, believe it or not. You guys uh, introduce yourselves, please, my esteemed panelists. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Sangster. I'm the Vice President of Industry Security Strategies with a cybersecurity firm called eCentire. And one of our primary markets in, in a large client-based contingent that we work with is law firms. And, and as such, I spend a lot of time advising the technology leadership, uh, managing partners, boards, et cetera, on dealing with security and IT and the innovation of technology, not as an IT problem to be framed that way, but to think about it more as a business opportunity and managing risk. Hello, I am Meredith Williams-Range. I'm the Chief Knowledge and Client Value Officer with Sherman & Sterling based in New York. Um, I've been in the industry for about two decades. I was an M&A and taxation lawyer for a very long time before I transitioned and became what I call as a recovering lawyer and got to define my future career of that. Also in uh, my past, I've served as the President of the Board of Directors for the International Legal Technology Association. And that organization actually services all major global law firms, as well as most of the Fortune 500 companies from a legal ops and legal technology. You met Joy this morning. She is the CEO, and so she runs that staff, but they have a volunteer bank of people that lead it, about 25,000 members globally of that. Um, hi, my name is Jean Soma. I'm the Legal Insights Executive and Counsel at AFI Group, which is a very fancy way of saying that I'm the only lawyer that works at a software company. Um, that company makes textual analytics that is serving the legal industry as well as others, and my uh, fantastic job that I love very much is to help our software creators and our team make software that actually suits a legal need. Before that, for longer than I will admit, um, I was in legal services, and so I worked on um, a lot of teams that dealt with e-discovery, compliance, large litigation, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm also an adjunct professor at the New York Law School, so I'm bringing to the panel today the, the software opinion, but, but really that's fake. It's the legal service opinion hidden like it's software. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Taylor. Uh, I just started at Liberty Mutual 24 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may ask, you know, no one really ends up in insurance on purpose. Uh, I actually started as a prosecutor and a litigator and then found my way to Liberty Mutual. Um, went back, got an MBA, and found myself really focusing on the business of law. Uh, Liberty Mutual is one of the largest PNC carriers in the world. And as such, we have a little bit of litigation going on as a result of our uh, policyholder activity. And so uh, litigation is a core competency of ours. So we have a fairly large legal ops group of about 200 people. Within that group, uh, I lead a uh, competency called legal ideation and transformation. If that sounds made up, it is. Um, but really what that's about is making sure that uh, instead of being disrupted, we're transforming. Uh, that means we're paying attention. So. Uh, really what we're doing is we're looking at how legal services are being delivered today, how they might be delivered tomorrow, and how we might influence that. Okay, so just to let you know, we organize the panel by topic. We have four topics, and each speaker has graciously uh, accepted the role of giving like a five-minute uh, address to that topic, and then the, the rest of the panel will speak for another five. First topic that we have for Meredith is the major drivers for innovation and legal technology. Uh, both in-house and at law firms. So I'll, I'll take this and start it out by saying what my job is. As a client value officer, how many of you have heard of that type of role before? Probably not. You know, some, some have. Many students probably have not. And that's because I, got, I actually got to help write my job description. Um, so I got to define that. But as a client value officer, my 100 plus team is focused on how we improve the relationship with the client. Now to the firm, a lot of that is focused on the financial side and the margin. 
Okay, so we, we focus on business economics, process, tech, data, you name it, it that's, that's our internal focus. So we're constantly evaluating why we as a law firm have to change. And when we think about it, there's kind of three critical drivers that are pushing us to innovate, pushing us to look at our business model differently. The first one is a changed client. The second one is changing competition to our legal work not just to law firm, but to the actual legal work, and I'll come back to that in a second. And the last one is that we have a very different regulatory environment that we practice in today than when I started 18 years ago. So a little bit about the changed client first, and I'm glad that we have one on the panel here because I think we'll, we'll definitely show different perspectives from that. I can tell you that 18 years ago when I started practicing law, the phone rang. You didn't have to go out and drum up business. It was just there. I'm telling you now as a law student, it, is, it does not work that way any longer. You have a very savvy client, many of which have, have MBAs, business economic backgrounds. They understand cost benefit ratios, P&Ls, far better than you're going to. And they're focused on not becoming the cost centers of their organizations on a, on a constant basis. That's their battle. So what you have to do is you have to help them help themselves. Okay, so a lot of times where we focus our efforts, and I spend about 50% of my time with clients. I'm going to be at a client event all day tomorrow helping renegotiate a number of deals with them. They're focused on fixed fees or fee caps. And we're a global company. So when we look at global, what do we mean by that? So I kind of divide it regionally. Asia and, and our Asia market is 100% fee capped with our clients, which means if we're going to be any, any way profitable, we've got to be as effective and as efficient as possible. The EMEA and European market is really about 60% fee capped in that space, and then the Americas is 25 to 30. That's changing. It's going to become more and more and more, and the only way to really improve margin is to be effective and efficient at what you do. Uh, and the levers to pull are always going to be process, people, technology, and data, and those should be your four major components that, as a law student, you learn about today. So the changed client, I, I wouldn't even say changing, it is a changed past tense client, and they want different things from us as a law firm, and we have to deliver upon that. The, the changing competition, there's a survey that I highly recommend that you read, and it's the Altman Well survey. It's been done for about 18 years now, and it was, it's very interesting because it interviews general counsel and what they're looking for and their issues. And again, as a law firm, I have to pay attention to that, and I have to make certain my, my team members globally are paying attention. For the first time in history, in December of 2018, it actually showed that law firms are no longer the dominant force as to taking the in-house legal work. For the first time in history. And when you go and interview those GCs, they will tell you flat out, it's not going back. So percentage-wise, law firms are getting about 45% of the work from in-house, 6% are going to the big four and alike, and 49% is staying in-house. So I'm competing with my own client. And how do you do that? With efficiency. How do you do that? You think about the type of work. You, you prove where that expertise matters. And I think Colin from the first panel was talking about this morning, expertise always still matters. That's never going to go away for that ultra premium work, but they're still going to continue to bring in that commoditized and experienced work in house. So you've got to find that balance. So, changed client, changing competition, and the other one is the changing regulatory environment in which we practice. Over the course of the past 24 months, we now face more data regulation than ever before in our practice. And I can tell you between GDPR, CCPA, and every other acronym that, you, that exists out there, learn them, live them, breathe them. Um, I, I work closely with our general counsel because how we practice matters more than it ever has. How we interchange data between our New York office and our London office and our Parisian office matters. And it's not that I need to have technology to impede it, I need technology to actually do the work now. And so legal tech is the, is the only answer that we we have for so many of these issues and so many of these new demands facing upon us. Yeah, so if I can react to a couple of things that Meredith said, um, one key thing that I think the students can take from what Meredith said is that if you have not yet taken a course on statistics, if you have not yet taken a course on 
consuming data analytics or being able to interpret data analytics, you better do so now. Um, I will tell you that the clients that Meredith is talking about, including us, we oftentimes have better data on the performance of the firm than the law firms do, and we're sharing that back. Um, so the law firms need to probably catch up from our perspective, um, but we are very data-driven there, so that's one. Um, two, um, you know, you mentioned about competing with us for in-house. Uh, that's absolutely accurate. Uh, for those of you that just are looking to graduate and think that the law firm is like kind of the direct path, it is a great path, but it is only one of the paths. It's not the only. There are others, alternative legal service providers out there, which we are shuttling work to. That's the high commodity, you know, I mean, high volume, low risk work that we're pushing out. And when we do that, guess what work we bring in house? Work that we used to send outside to law firms. So we're bringing that work in house. And lastly, the thing I would say uh, kind of bears on what you said, Meredith, was that there's this uh, perception gap, I think, between what the law firms are doing and what the in-house folks perceive. And that's especially in the area of innovation. And I think innovation and tech kind of are rolled together here. Um, there was a recent survey by the Blickstein Group uh, that asked a number of in-house folks, um, do they agree or disagree about whether or not their law firms are being innovative? And two-thirds of the respondents said, no, we don't think yeah. they are. Yeah. Um, now, the good news is, the, another question was asked about, uh, does outside counsel generally make strong efforts to understand the problems we face as a law department? Two-thirds said yes, they are. So there's just a gap that we're not seeing what you're doing, maybe, necessarily, and I just want to make students aware of that. Anything further? If, okay, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, the next question for Jean has to do with the plethora of barriers to the adoption of legal technology and efficient solutions. By the way, I'm not uh, texting anybody. These are the notes. For the, uh, <laughs> we're all doing it. My phone is out here. <laughs> Just let that's, you know. That's how we show we're tech savvy. That's um, right. We have notes on phones. I'm so, I like it. I like <laughs> you, have, you have paper. You have tech got, paper. This, you're being and very corporate right now. I like it. Cool. I like and it. And I don't know what you're uh, all prepared to answer about, but I, I, I had just mentioned uh, barriers, including business structures, you know, which can be billable hour or partnership, but also uh, regulatory uh, environment or training or attitudes found, uh, et cetera. Sure. Thank so um, I, I think when we're talking about barriers to adoption of technology, it's a good dichotomy to what, to what Meredith is saying. And I want to be very clear. What I'm about to say is going to sound very negative. But it doesn't mean that we're not making changes. It just means that when you are trying to make a change, you might run into this. I'll give you a real world example that has nothing to do with law or technology. I have been on a diet since probably I was old enough to know that you should be on a diet. And I'm really good at convincing myself that I'm doing a good job with my diet. Then I'm also really good at, at figuring out the day that I'm like, oh, this diet's not going to work. Forget it. I'll go back to what I'm doing. That's basically what legal tech adoption is. It is my terrible diet that sometimes I stick to, sometimes I don't. Then I'm back on it again, and then I'm not. It doesn't mean that I don't want to be on that diet. It doesn't mean that it's not going to work for me someday. It just means that I'm really bad at it, and I can make excuses. So here are my excuses. Uh, when I think about barriers, I, I think about a couple things. First of all, why we adopt technology, how we adopt it, and then the, the ever so hidden how we feel about that adoption. So let's talk about why we adopt it. And there's really four main drivers that, that I think about and I think Meredith's touched on. Lowering costs, driving revenue, reducing risk, and transforming your business or your industry. So let's tackle lowering costs first. Here's a barrier to adopting technology that's supposed to be lowering costs is that technology is a cost. If you are a law firm, you have to buy it. If you are in-house, you have to buy it. At a law firm, it could be, and oftentimes it is, very difficult to resell that technology to your corporate client because you have legal service providers that just wrap it in and it's cheap and it just does the magic thing. At a law firm, it doesn't necessarily work that way because you're used to a different billable model. And so it's hard to wrap that in. So to you, to your managing partners, it feels like a cost. For in-house counsel, it literally is a cost. And in fact, let's add to that problem, you're a cost center. You make no money for the company whatsoever. And you can run around and say that you're mitigating risk, and you are, and I'm sure you're great at it, but still at the end of the day, you're not driving revenue. So asking for a tool is very difficult, especially when, again, as a software provider, not all tools solve all problems, and so you have to bring on more than one, you have to tweak it, you need someone to help you with it, so it ends up costing more than you wanted to spend. And so that's really a big driver for you know, companies, law firms, and, and legal um, operations groups to not bring in technology. The second is that driving revenue example. 
If I buy something that makes me more efficient and I make my money on my billable hour, I bill less hours, I make more money, I'm eating my revenue. Back to the in-house counsel, I literally can't make revenue. I couldn't if I wanted to. I'd have to go learn how to do the thing that the operations team does, and that would make me change my job. And so that, that revenue, that kind of, you know, that revenue idea, it's really hard to wrap our heads around as lawyers. And so it keeps us from wanting to go and spend time, non-billable administrative time, yikes, to go learn how to use this thing that is then going to erode my billables and make me work longer hours in order to bill the same amount. Mitigating risk. When I think about risk, first let's think about what risk is. If you are in a manufacturing state of mind, risk is your employees getting injured, your product malfunctioning, financial sector, right? It's giving, bad, uh, it's giving bad advice. It's having your employees act in a way that's not in compliance with, with rules, regulations, that sort of thing. In legal, it's giving bad legal advice or breaking privilege or, or both. So if you think about that risk, the way that you solve for that is actually more information. Right? I can give better legal advice the more information I can consume, the more things I can read, the more stuff that I have. I cannot break privilege by reading every single word of every single document and never making a production ever. That's a hoarder's way of thinking, and that's what we are. We are educational hoarders. That's what we do. And so that is the complete opposite of using a piece of technology that's just going to slough off all of this stuff and read documents really quickly and, and make us really good at our job. It's, it's the complete opposite of what we want. From a transformation perspective, this is also something that I think is a fundamental challenge, not just in legal, but any service that has this human capital element of it. Medicine is also a great example. I, I believe this, and we can argue about it here or later, that if you are a, a human capital service, that the transformation that you need for your business, although yes, client-driven, starts with you. You're a doctor, you're a surgeon, you need to just get more patients treated quickly, and it's not because you want to help more people necessarily, or maybe you do, but people die. If you don't heal them, they die. That's just kind of what it is. So you have to use technology in order to be a better doctor, and so you're going to take that technology in. If the technology makes you a better lawyer, you're gonna be more apt to adopt it. So legal research technology. This is, now you'll know how, what spectrum of dinosaur I am. When, you move, when we move from books, those are the things that you read that are like have paper, you guys probably have no idea, um, to do legal research to like Westlaw and Lexis. <laughs> don't, don't even. <laughs> oh, that's, those that's are the days, that's those painful. are the days. But when we made that move, it, it, it wasn't because we wanted to charge our clients less for legal research, it was that we wanted to do better legal research because you never want to stand in front of a judge and quote the wrong precedent, very embarrassing. So that was really the driver. We were still charging for the legal research hours, which, side note, you probably won't be able to soon if you can already. Yeah. Um, but that was the driver. And so when we're talking about transformation, there's not that, you, you have to have that, that competition, one, the thing that you need, and then also you really need that external pressure, like the legal service providers, the big four. We're seeing that, we definitely are. But I would say that the least transformed lawyers are those that aren't necessarily being pressured. So that, that's the why would you, why would you adopt uh, legal technology. And then let's talk about how. So I like to think of this as, um, is it a choice or are you forced? And here's what I mean by that. If we go back to manufacturing, General Motors makes a more efficient assembly line. You might be out of a job. If you stood on the place that got retooled, you're out, and, there's, and that's it, so be it. That is the, the, the pace of progress. Or General Mills introduced a new, um, a new machine that will do the job better and you have to learn how to use that machine. Same rules apply. If you don't learn how to use the machine, someone else is going to and you're just, that's it, you don't have a job. So I would argue that industries that have great strides in adoption of new ideas, new processes, new technologies are those industries where the people who worked in them had to either adopt or die. That was just what it is. Um, that's simply not the case in, in legal. That's just not really that's not really what we are, and that's great. Um, but that fire under our butts just isn't, isn't really there. There's also, there's also another part of this, and it's upskilling. Um, how many people are familiar with upskilling? Okay, so some. So there's a really interesting IBM survey that they just put out talking about um, how many workers in the world will have to be upskilled. And I think it's something like, let's see, I wrote it down. 120 million workers throughout the world are going to have to be part of this upskilling. So basically, they have a set of skills in the job that they have now. Their job has changed, thank you, artificial intelligence. And now they have to learn something to do their job better. So that's where upskilling is. And so the problem is that it used to take, in 2014, it took four days to upskill a worker. In 2019, it takes 36. So we're talking about a lot of time to train somebody to use something that makes their job better. Now pretend you're a lawyer. 
you probably don't have 36 non-billable days to just be like messing around with the newest technology. Not only do you not have that, but your law firm really can't have you not billable for that long. And so that's really an, that's really an issue, right? So it takes a lot of time and focus, it takes a lot of non-billable effort, and, and that's going to be a problem. Also, back to that risk, there's hidden information in that process, and you're, we're still risk averse. The last thing that I'll say, and this is kind of the, the squishy part of it, but honestly, I think that this is the most important part. Who's ever heard of the phrase, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room? Okay, so I will have my mother call every one of you and teach you that lesson. It's very important. And as lawyers, they don't, we don't teach you that because you want to be the smartest person in the room. That's the point. That's why we went to law school. That's what my diploma says. But the fact of the matter is that when it comes to technology, this is what makes us leery of it. So the earliest form of technology in legal was a woman. Her name was my secretary. And when I was... <laughs> She's a wonderful piece of software. Um, when I was dictating all of these great things that my lawyer mind had, she was writing them down, and then she would go away, and she would collate the data, and she'd come back. She would give it to me. I would read it, and then I could go to my client and wow him with all of the knowledge that I've dropped because of my software. And as technology evolved and she stopped having to write it with her hand and learned how to use the typewriter and the word processor, yes, that's advancement, but guess what? I still did the same thing where I paced the room and I gestured wildly and I said these great things and she typed. And what happened was the process got easier, faster for me, got it, faster for me, but the fact is the only person that learned anything was her, not me. And so we have partners at law firms who still have emails printed out for them. They don't even hit the print button themselves. And so they, <laughs> we're laughing and this is so true and you will meet them. Please tell them I said hello. <laughs> But the point here is that we have to, as an industry, we will never change if we still have people that sit in their lofty palaces and have someone named secretary print their emails and pretend that that is a way to give legal service, when in fact, the secretary who's printing the email has more skills yeah. to go work in the future than, than they do. And so I think that's an important thing. If you take nothing away from my verbal diary, it's the how we feel about change that is going to affect us most than the rest of it. So I'll add just a couple of points very, very briefly to this. And th this first one may be slightly controversial, but it, it feeds off of what you just said. So wh what we're talking about are what are the, some of the barriers to the adoption of legal technology. You have to start with what are some of the issues with some of that technology. Is it actually answering a business problem? That's always the first question. Is it changing your business model too far outside of what your comfort zone is, which is a different conversation. But one of the biggest ones that we face is bias of some of the algorithms that are being written right now. I had a lovely conversation with one of the best pieces of technology I've ever seen, uh, Premier AI, a couple of days ago, and I said, how many female or diverse individuals do you have as your data scientists and, and your engineers that are creating this, the algorithms? Zero. And when you have that, no offense to any white male sitting in the room, when you have just that one view, we have an eight bias. We're going to build that into the technology and the algorithms that we're writing. So that has to change. So learning about data scientists, learning about that, getting more women, getting more diverse individuals in those careers are only going to make this piece and this technology more impactful to, to law firms and to, to in-house. Did, did you have a comment you wanted to make? I was just gonna quickly, um mentioned it, I do think that the, the real big challenge here is that we can't necessarily align the IT problem and the ones and zeros of IT to the business risk, and, and not just the business risk, but the business opportunity side that can enable it. Um, and I think we're still in search of that kind of Rosetta Stone that helps us translate dollars and risk into ones and zeros. And that's certainly one of the biggest issues I see in law firms today. And I think one of the biggest asks I ever get is you need to help me build the business case and take this to my managing partners to convince them that it's worth the investment. Okay, um, and before I move on, I'll just mention in terms of regulatory that a lot of stuff that comes up is also whether the par partnership model is conducive to innovation. Right. Um, and then there's other regulatory issues around alternate business structures, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, but we don't have a lot of time. So let me go to the third topic for Bob, which has to do with the structure of innovation which would potentially include management and funding, design, pilots, internal versus external development, and recruiting. Yeah, thanks, Ron. So um, at Liberty Mutual, you know, let me just set a little context. We're very fortunate to have a general counsel in Jim Kelleher who sees great value in legal R&D and understands and committing um, funds and resources to that. So I think it starts with a commitment, number one. 
Um, number two, just to kind of give you a sense before I get off and talk about what we do in the legal operations department, a little context is important. We're, we have a little bit of an embarrassment of riches because we've got 2,100 people in our legal department worldwide. 200 of those are in our legal operations group. Many of those are in our, our billing space. But we have a little bit more resource than the normal kind of Fortune 500 company. Not all companies are like this, but as you heard earlier in the discussions today, Legal ops is here, it's real, and it is being driven by clients, and the change is being driven from the client side into the law firm side. So any of you students out there that are truly interested in transforming or getting into the business of law, where that might not have been a traditional path in the past to go directly into in-house, believe it or not, Liberty Mutual is hiring directly out of law school students that have the kind of skills that we need. And that used to never happen before. We used to always hire laterally. So I just want to set that as a stage. So from a structural standpoint, some of the things that we've done uh, to uh, address how you innovate within a large, you know, conservative uh, legal department, one, you need a specific space to innovate. It's not that we didn't have an, a council within our operation that were, you know, coming up with great ideas. It's just that they couldn't work them off the side of their desk. They didn't have the time or the bandwidth to do that. And good ideas, as Jeff Marple will tell you, he's our uh, innovation lead here in, at Liberty Mutual, need time to be incubated and protected and grow. And, you know, you need to work on POCs and you need, you know, folks to really kind of experiment. Uh, you need folks to experiment the various vendors that we're giving presentations today and see if they actually have applications for you. You know, one of the little, what do I call SBT things that we do, our sneaky bastard technique, is that we, uh, <laughs> instead of trying to force uh, these vendors down the throat of our senior leaders and say, you need this, is that we set up vendor days where we have our senior leaders attend. We'll bring in three or four vendors, expose them to the art of the possible and allow them to make that connection so that we get a pull rather than, you know, trying to push that on us. And, um, you know, uh, again, culture starts from the top. Uh, so within my group, we, we've really assembled the following types of individuals. One is someone that just focuses strictly on innovation, and that was very purposefully a non-lawyer. Again, Jeff Marple, someone who can pro uh, properly ask those why questions with legitimacy, you know, to learn, why do you, why do, you do this this way, right? Um, Next is uh, process improvement professionals. So we stole folks over from the business. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, we talked a lot about tech today. Uh, if you do not un uh, address underlying process first, all you're doing is kind of putting lipstick on that pig and putting a tech over a bad process. That is a massive mistake. So you should be um, looking at process improvements. So we've got those professionals. We have project management professionals. Um, you know, I know this is going to offend some of the lawyers in the room, and I might resemble this remark, is that uh, you know, you're really good at lawyering, but you probably suck at project management. And what I mean by that <laughs> is that, is that yeah. you have trouble closing the gap between strategy and execution. And you know, sometimes it takes bringing people from the business over to do that. And uh, so we brought that into the legal department. It only took me probably dropping off 12 different articles to our GC over the course of four months before he finally said, I, I got it. Uh, you, you can hire some folks. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have legal information services, which is just library, but I don't want to over look that because that's actually like an, an in-house legal librarian function. That's where data-driven law takes place and that's where librarians and data scientists. We actually have data scientists embedded in our legal department for any of you law students that want to combine an interest in data science and law. Um, we do not beg, borrow, and steal that resource from anyone else. Um, we also have a competency around competitive intelligence, which just means we're paying attention to what's going on in the marketplace, what's working, what's not, how do we learn from that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, how does that competitive intelligence inform strategy so we have responsibility around strategy. So Ron, when you talk about structure, right, what we've done is we've tried to set up uh, a group of individuals in the legal department that are focused on supporting our lawyers and our legal professionals and our compliance professionals to do their best work and let them focus on the art of lawyering and then give them the tools that they need to perform the best that they possibly can. We're okay on time. I think it would be important to hear how this mirrors when we go to a, a law firm. There's huge differences in incentives for innovation, and, and we, we will get to uh, some of the risks, but it's already, we've seen the issue around technology increasing efficiency and then hurting a bottom line based on billable hour. 
which means that the structure of innovation at a law firm has to kind of sneak in under the radar yeah. and somehow prove itself to increase revenue in an efficiency model. And I'll just say that what I have heard is, oh, you know, that e-discovery work, that, that low margin stuff, screw that, we're gonna leave that alone, we're gonna go after the high end stuff. Of course, there's not enough room at the high end for law firms to do this. And so a difference is those rare law firms, some of them at the top, that's, they don't have to worry about it. But even Wachtell is trying to be efficient because they want to deliver more. Uh, what I say is, would you rather pay $2,000 an hour for a lawyer with or without technology at their fingertips? Um, but on the low end, that feeds the rest. So I, let me just hear if there's any feedback about uh, law firms. I'll just add to that, being, being in, in, in the large law firm space, and every law firm is very different, structurally, culturally, everything, and what works. It all depends upon the actual type of work that you're doing and your geographical representation of that, because I've been at two different firms, and those are very different culturally firms, culturally related firms. The main reason my job was created and my entire department was created at Sherman & Sterling was for the exact same purpose that you're talking about and how House. So I'm the client value officer. I have about 100 individuals, half of which are lawyers, that report in through me. And it's teams such as legal project management, process improvement, research and information services, knowledge management, discovery, um, all of our ethics team from a compliance perspective all, all report in as well. And again, it's about 50% lawyers, some of which have, have joined us directly out of law school to manage either compliance, to manage actually pricing and negotiation. It all depends. The way, we are, the way we look at it is that we are the alternative staff that the lawyers have used to be doing all of the functions that we do today but they can't do that any longer. It's building out budgets, it's managing to those budgets, it's actually negotiating price. My staff go in and negotiate price. Some of our lawyers never do that. They're not good at doing that. I'm gonna be very frank about that. They simply want to practice law. We're taught in law school how to practice law. We're not taught that we actually have to go bill and collect which are never fun components to do, but they have to be done for the business. So I have pricing experts, I have process experts. So when we see a practice area that have major margin issues, we send our process people in first, analyze the process, figure out where the breakdowns are, bring in tech, data, and alternative people to make that better and to improve the margins, usually by double digits if possible. So structurally, my team was created for the sole purpose of actually innovating and creating a new way of innovation. And innovation does not equal technology. It, it does not. A lot of times, it's process first. Yeah. It's yeah. innovating that process. Technology is usually 10% of that problem. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna, okay, I'm gonna to go to the fourth part here. I'm trying to keep it on. So we have time for uh, Q&A actually is, is our goal. Um, Mark has been kind enough to take on the issue of risks of innovation and in legal technology, including regulatory changes, or new forms of competition, when the innovator's dilemma to destroy your own cash cow, uh, staff cohesiveness, or notions of failure and mistakes. Thank you. Great, thanks. So uh, I'm gonna start off by saying to keep my license as a cybersecurity expert, I have to talk about things that go bump in the night. And I will talk about a few stories that get far more entertaining and I speak a lot faster after I've had a couple of drinks, so <laughs> join me at the cocktails and I can go into the details. But let me start with one of the first points and I wanna draw on what was talked about earlier here. And I call it the red queen effect. And that's the notion that as a tech provider, as a firm, as a business with inside counsel, whatever it is, right, you are implored just to survive, you have to constantly innovate and constantly change. That is not gonna go away. And what does that mean from a vendor perspective? It means you're constantly changing. And that can lead to issues, right? That rapid change often means we have limited understanding. It also means we often jump first um, before we look as to where we're gonna land, right? And that happens. And what does that do? That introduces risk. And I'm gonna start with a very simple story. Everybody knows about the grounding of the 737 MAX, right? Why did that happen? Because under competitive pressures, they had to update an old airframe to compete because the major airline carriers were buying Airbus and we had the fastest way to do that, to get to market, was to put new fuel-efficient engines on the old plane. Well, what did that do? Made the back end heavy, and because of that, the plane would climb. So they came up with clever software that would drop the nose when this started to happen. Except that software didn't quite behave the way it was supposed to, and it would fight the pilot until, as we know, two sad um, accidents occurred this year because of it. So I want you to step back and think about that story, right? There was a technological IT issue, but that wasn't the heart of it. 
The real problem there was the competitive drive and the business decisions that were put in place. Pilots who flew that plane had to take one hour iPad training to upgrade. Why did they do that? Because they put minimal backup controls in the system, which then the FAA mandated you didn't need to do expensive flight simulator time, expensive upgrades, which saved the airlines a lot of money. So they knocked a whole bunch of the business barriers down without truly thinking about the consequences. And of course, now we know that's what the Justice Department and that will continue on. But I think that really frames it, right? Is how do we go about, as I talked about that Rosetta Stone that makes it so much difficult for our IT and our vendors to talk to our managing partners, right? Where we can, we can find that, that common language and vocabulary. How do we meet those requirements yet minimize the risks? And I think there's a matrix of three common factors. The first one we've talked about here is this digital sprawl, right? Everything's digital, that's not going away unless you get a cabin in the woods somewhere and you put your cash under your, under your bed. You're, you're stuck with this for the rest of your life, right? And we know it's just gonna get faster. The second part is, and of course this is my cybersecurity um, piece coming up, is that there are parties out there willing to exploit the vulnerabilities that are created in this knowledge gap. And frankly, if they don't, if it's not an insider or a criminal or whoever it happens to be a nation state, whoever it is, I'm pretty sure Murphy's gonna show up and make sure that when you drop the toast, it lands butter side down. It's just how it works, right? And the third piece of this, is that accountability has really grown. It was really kind of fuzzy in the beginning, right? We, we have codes of conduct and we have regulators. Well, now we have class action suits, but more importantly, we have insurance claims, claims that are, uh, are denied, as an example, and that's, Kate, that's causing court precedence, right? So we're beginning to get a better feel for what are my obligations as a firm, as any kind of business, as a vendor, et cetera. And all three of those are the factors that both the vendor, both the IT provider, and the firm itself have to deal with, right? You have to marry those. And those risks are real. I've spent time researching this over the last year, and I've interviewed nearly 2,000 senior executives in this role, and what we found is nearly half of all those firms had experienced what they deemed material breaches because of technology they had just adopted, right? That's a significant number. That's a staggering and highly disappointing number, right? Here's what's worse. Only 15% of those breaches were actually reported by the vendor, by the party. So the other 85% were either detected by the firm or they were detected by law enforcement when they show up in your boardroom and say you're about to have a bad day, clear your calendar, whatever it is that, <laughs> that happens to occur, right? Here's the next kicker of that. 85% of those firms use references to validate technology. So they've gone and asked people and said, hey, what do you think of this, this technology, this tool, has this helped optimize your business? Yeah, it's great, it's rocking. They have no idea what's gone on in the shadows, and what else has occurred, right? So effectively, we can almost argue about 85% of those references are probably invalid. Yes, I know it's not a one-to-one, -one, but let's just, you know, give me the math. I'm in marketing, I'm not a scientist. So what does it lead to? It leads to a couple of things. Simple misuse. I don't know if everybody remembers from last year, Wells Fargo had a major breach that became public in the Wall Street Journal, and they, they of course, got the slap on the wrist from multiple regulators because hundreds of thousands of, of uh, Records of high wealth individuals had accidentally been released, and this was done during discovery. And this is because the poor attorney who was using a new tool, who had not been trained on it adequately, did a search to find the information they were required to provide, and they thought when they saw the first set of queries, right, you know, one to a thousand, just like when we do a Google search, right, we get one to ten and we keep clicking next, um, they didn't realize that that was just the beginning of the search. So they pulled those, that, uh, what they thought was just that thousand they were looking for, and they gave them uh, orders of magnitude larger than that, and that led to that breach. So that's a simple example of misuse through lack of communication, lack of training, and proper adoption. Worse, uh, this is a story I was personally involved in last year, was a nation state that de uh, decided to target a law firm simply because it was in retaliation for one of the clients they were representing. And this government deemed them a dissident. Right, whether that's right or wrong, uh, true or not. And by the way, it was a very innocuous or benign type of practice. So we are not talking about major litigation here or criminal activity. It's talking about immigration law in this case. Right? Now this led to a point where they were able to uh, infiltrate through a vendor. They were able to get into their network through a whole bunch of misunderstandings and you know those thousands of elements that all come together to lead to that, that, uh, that event, right? that, that orchestration of disaster, if you will. Um, they were able to control email servers, um, network, um, core network elements, and so on. And what was worse is not only were they doing this and extracting information, 
but I'll leave this to your imagination to make sure that the lawyers uh, felt duly punished, they were also planting information. So you can connect the dots or fill in the gap to determine what sort of information, pictures, videos, emails, et cetera, would have to be placed on your computer that would probably end your career, end your marriage, if you, you, know, if, if you are, and uh, you know, land you in jail, right? And that's exactly what they're doing, so that in some cases, they play hardball. And I think the challenges we face here uh, can really be wrapped up in three things. I call it the three Ps of, of third-party risk, right? Is the first one is policies. Why are you adapting the technology? What risks does it introduce, right? How do those two balance the gain that you're gonna get with it with the, the risks that might occur? And then what controls do you have to put in place to minimize those risks? And that's the second piece. So what procedures do you have? How do you conduct your due diligence? So as a vendor, you have to think about what hoops am I gonna have to go through? What answers should I, uh, should I have to have that competitive market advantage when I go to sell my product? And then the third piece, of course, is the promises. That's the contractual obligations, right? So that's, that's the who does what? What are our roles and responsibility? Do you install it? Do you patch and maintain it for me? How, does all those, how do all those things work? And in the event that something does occur, who's on the hook, right? Who do I have to report this? When do I notify it? And the advice I always give to firms is treat yourself like a mini GDPR or a mini HIPAA. Right, 72 hours of notice. If your spidey senses go off, if the hairs on the back of your neck start, you know, stand up and they start tingling, I want to know about it. And we'll eventually baseline. And there's lots of good rules around this, particularly in New York, in the Department of fin Financial Services, that I think has summed this up in a very simple way. And that's exactly what they talk about. Yeah. So just to amplify Mark's point on this around technical competency and making sure that when you're in a law firm, you understand how to protect your data and your clients' data. Uh, you know, I can tell you what Fortune 250 companies are calling you law firms. They're calling you the soft underbelly yes. of our cybersecurity plan. Yes. That's right. That's what, that's what we consider law firms. And so we, we don't trust that you've got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as a result, we're running you through the gauntlet of having to go through very strict, as Mark, you know, indicated, um, you know, kind of, uh, rigorous testing to make sure that you can do our work. And if you can't pass or answer those questions correctly, you don't get the work. So one of the things I want to comment on is I think that you're talking about the risks of poor technology implementation. And the reason I say that is because if you implement it really well, there's the other risk of what happens when you start, as I was saying, killing the billable hour and having to negotiate the, the monetization changes that have to happen or whether there's staff cohesiveness, as some people want to use it, some people don't. You might get laterals leaving. So, uh, or, or you know, as we'll move into now in this last part, what do you do with a legal technologist or somebody who, uh, a law student who's tech savvy, wanting to help build systems yeah. that are bringing money into a firm, but not yeah. eat what you kill kind of a model. So, you know, how much are you wanting to pay somebody because the system that they worked on is making money? So I'm just talking about this plethora of risks that have to do with a successful implementation rather than when you're implementing it poorly, which really can derail a lot of uh, innovation. Well, it changes your business model. It, oh, yeah. Successful implementation absolutely changes your business model. And I'll give you one example. Um, we implement Kira at Sherman and Sterling for all of our M&A due diligence. As an M&A lawyer, I learned how to be an M&A lawyer by doing due diligence and sitting in a room with documents and understanding that. So one, not only do I have to price that differently, but we also have to figure out how we educate our young lawyers on how to become expert M&A lawyers. And, the, and, and I don't have all the solutions to that today. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I do. But those are absolute risks that we face. It challenges how we bill. It challenges what we bill. And there are some answers to that with effective pricing and, and bundled pricing, which is really the main answer that we find, but the harder question is education. And, and that's the harder one that no one has really solved, is if we're taking away how you do that and how you learn to be an expert m and lawyer or an expert litigator or expert XYZ, we have to replace that in some way. And so we're, we're creating programs. We've created a program at Sherman called the Nimble Lawyer that's a seven-year program that actually teaches our young lawyers from day one how to be technology, AI, data-inspired, how to become managers, how to actually think think about a P&L, how to think about the levers of margin, which is different because with all due respect, when I came out of law school, I knew how to be a, law a lawyer. I did not know how to run a business. And you're being taught right now how to be a lawyer, a great lawyer, but you're not being taught how to run a business. I need both. 
from you. I need you to be that commodity. And to me, that's one of the biggest risks is the business model shift to a law firm as also the education of our young lawyers. Uh yeah, and I, I don't want to, uh, just to make sure, like, just to comment on, on uh, or to, uh, to sort of counter to some degree, Ron, is I want to make sure that I don't leave that taste in your mouth that these were poor implementations I'm talking about. Because you're right, in some cases, they absolutely are, right? There are core elements that were not done. That one example of the nation state, there were lots of things in there that best practices that weren't met. That said, one of the challenges, I think, with innovative technology is we don't always know what all the risks are, right? We can kind of take some of them from what we've learned before, right? Yeah. We can say, okay, so cloud has taught us some lessons in the adoption of cloud, but how much of that can I apply to AI? How's AI gonna be misused, right? How could that be mistakenly misconfigured, as, as you talked about, right? The, depending on the, the perspectives and cultural and social perspectives that go into it who's matters. developing those algorithms, you're gonna have blind spots, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the reality, and that's why I talked about Murphy's Law to some degree. There are lots of good businesses out there that do a lot of great work and have a lot of really good IT practices in place. They still end up as, as, as victims, right? So, um, but you make, you make an excellent point. Uh, I, I wanna make, if I, there's one issue that I haven't really talked about. It's come up actually from the keynote and on forward, uh, which has to do with efficiency balanced against quality. And I really wanna highlight this because this is a lot of what I try to teach in class. For e-discovery systems, for AI, for anything that we work with here, the issue is how do you measure the quality of that system? And I, I often say that if all we cared about was efficiency, we could settle disputes with a coin toss. And that's <laughs> not what we're after. Right. So the issue there is at what point do we risk quality by going to more innovation te um, efficient models? And that's not clear first of all, because like document automation is much more efficient and more accurate. The other thing is where people can't afford a lawyer and we're talking about access to justice, it doesn't have to be as good as your standard lawyer because they don't get to a lawyer. So is it better than they're going it alone? And that's a different notion of what quality might mean. So quality is a subtle point and efficiency may or may not impact it positively or negatively, and that's one of the risks, in my opinion, of working, move, moving towards innovation. Yeah. I'd like to open it up. If you guys want to say something, and go ahead, but then we can take questions too. So, yeah, yeah you just to kind of please. comment on that, I think it was said before, um, you know, and I know this will offend all the high achieving uh, students in the room, but oftentimes we don't need a work. I mean, so, you know, to get to your point about quality, right, um, this, somebody said it before, sometimes B work is okay or That's right. work is okay. You just need to kind of determine what that is and make value judgments and risk assessments around that. And the other is that, um, you know, we're all fighting this do more with less conundrum. Yeah. The way we look at it internally at Liberty is you do more with less at equal or better quality. Yes. Um, and that applies to whether we're farming work out to an ALSP or some other thing because you know, look, uh, the reality is, I think there was a survey that said like half or more of uh, in-house legal departments expect their budget to stay the same or go down mm -hmm. next year. So everybody's fighting this do more with less, but it doesn't mean that we're not able to do our jobs or to protect the company in a manner which we have been charged with doing so. Yeah. So, you know, the quality aspect has to be there, Ron, but I agree that you have to make risk assessments. Th that's actually why my research here at Harvard has to do with measuring legal quality, so, which is a t tough problem. Let me just Please. Uh, so from a software perspective too, and this is something that I say more now uh, that I work in software than I ever did when I was practicing, it's all about reasonableness. It's just reasonableness, not perfection, ever. I don't know how many times you've ever asked to be perfect, but that's, it's not reasonable to be perfect. And so when we're talking about implementation and um, efficiency versus correctness and, and, and you know, all of that, that's your sliding scale. So from a software perspective, for those of you who are really interested in building the next legal solution of the future, using those, you know, your lawyer brain and your legal reasoning, you have, to, you have to think about being flexible enough that you're not necessarily gonna solve all problems, but there might be an application for a wide spectrum if only sometimes you're perfect, sometimes you're less than perfect, and sometimes you're guessing. Because sometimes it is also okay to guess, and I think that's a very important sliding scale, and it's the first question you should ask yourself. Doing this thing, using this technology, how accurate do I have to be, and what actually is accurate? And who am I going to have to sell this to, and are they going to buy in? with my, my margin of error. So I think that's also very important. Yeah. That's right, and what's the consequence if I'm wrong? If it's nothing, then guess what? Flip your coin and go home. 
Um, I do wonder if we want to open it up for questions. So if people have questions, and if you have a particular one uh, responder you'd like to, please let us know. Great, thanks. Uh, fantastic panel. Uh, this question is for Meredith and Robert, but I think the other two will probably have some value to add to it as well. Uh, given the various objectives you're trying to meet to be determined, and uh, following a process where you identify the problems, you identify people in the process, and you get to the point where you're ready to start considering technology, are you finding a bias towards looking for something in the market or building? Depends on the problem. It really does. I, I, there's, there's no one answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, I think it really depends because, in, 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 to be frank with you, a law firm is not a technology company, nor should we ever be a technology company. And there are some fantastic vendors in this room that I know we work with and otherwise. Um, and and it, I'll just use a couple of examples. Right now, we're, we're evaluating the issues we face on time entry, and it's because we forget 40% of what we do the day before, and we have lawyers that don't build time for 30 days, and we won't discuss the margin issues that go along with that. Why am I going to build a new piece of technology when there's fantastic automated technology being built by people out in California right now? And so we typically will go buy first, if possible, but what we also find is that there are times where there's not a piece of technology that does exactly what we need it to do. Um, and in those cases, we will still find the right partner to help us build because we are not a technology company. Yeah, so uh, great question. We face this all the time uh, around the build versus buy. And, um, you know, the question often is to our IT folks who are extremely talented, we can build this, but then I come back and say, should we build this, right? And because that comes along with a lot of technical debt and maintenance and things of that issue. Um, so sometimes it's just a matter of repurposing a common business tool um, that might get you 80% of the way there. You know, they talked about everybody wants the perfect tool right, that is fit for purpose, and sometimes you're able to repurpose. Maybe, like for example, we've used Salesforce to help do law firm management. Yeah. Instead of buying a law firm management platform, we've repurposed a common business tool in an uncommon way, yeah. and met with the Salesforce folks and talked with them, and they were really excited about this. It's just one of many examples. There's so many things in the Office 365 suite that you can repurpose in your legal pro practice if you have the team that's willing to coach people up for that. The other is um, oftentimes, and it's kind of tangentially related to your question, is um, you know, often when you go to the lawyers and start trying to explain to them a solution, right? they'll give you 103 w reasons why it yeah. won't work. But or as more. we've found through or our, more. Or, or more, right? Uh, but what we've found through our, pro our process and our, our project is that if you actually, through design thinking, quickly prototype and put something in front of the lawyer, instead of getting objections, all of a sudden you start getting feature requests, mm -hmm. right? Oh, well, that's really interesting, but if it could do this and that, I'd be happy. So instead of going out and having to buy some really expensive piece of software that is exactly fit for purpose, quick prototype, get a couple additional features, boom, you're done and you're moving on. Yeah. More questions? Do we have students in here? No. <laughs> we, have we expected some That's students. Afraid to ask a question. You have a question back there? No. You're just you're just <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I guess like uh, if you're, for example, a first year associate and going to a law firm that doesn't um, use a lot of these legal technologies, and you do want to uh, introduce them into the law firm. I'll take that since I am in a law firm at this precise moment because um, I've been in your shoe and, and uh, your shoes particularly and as a young lawyer I <laughs> I was telling you this example earlier uh, I was that that person that said but why are we doing it that way but why constantly 18 years ago when I started out and my mentors <laughs> my mentor said to me at the time you have way too much personality to stay as a tax lawyer and I took that as a compliment uh, because I did ask that Find out about the culture of the firm. Find out if there are people yeah. similarly suited as myself, because those are usually the individuals that are driving that type of tech. Become close friends with your, your global technology solutions, your IT staff. 
because a lot of times they, they are looking for people that are interested in doing certain things. We have a ton of people in, in the law firm, as, as you referenced, that still have their emails printed out by their secretary, and that's not an exaggeration, and I know one that represents Microsoft, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, so it, it still happens. Become friends with those individuals, and a lot of times they're looking for testers and sandbox individuals. We have that. We have a, a bucket of about 300 people that are our sandbox users, where we put everything to test. Um, and that's really the quickest way, at least in a large law firm, to do that, and sometimes in the smaller firms as well. I think there's a question here. Right, I was just saying one of the best ways to do this too, right, is, is I think Meredith gave some great advice there, is also really just to align yourself to whatever the objectives are of the firm for that year, right? So really figure out what those priorities are um, and get in and build a case, right? Like that, I think in technology, all too often we see it's the, it is the shiny object or the latest and the greatest or whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah, build the case that says this is why we can do it and what it's going to effectively, what money is it going to put in the pockets of the managing partners. Well, it also helps to, to get a rainmaker on board who really wants some technology tools that their clients are asking for. And among the clients, in the, in the big law world, clients are often pushing tools. Uh, one of the things I would mention is when we look at new ways of doing innovation, uh, I look to see what t types of uh, information exchange we would have so that law firms are building systems that capitalize on their expertise and that the uh, clients are able to ping against the system rather than always having to call a lawyer. We see an example of this with uh, Littler with uh, their compliance HR system, which is really just there to answer questions for whether somebody's a consultant or an employee. And it's not going every time to the lawyer. So I'm looking for more and more of these systems to, to take over. So yeah, There are a ton of those actually on market today. There are a lot of firms, a lot of boutique firms that do that. Yeah. Littler's just the largest. I, BLP, is, BLP has been doing it, which was Brian K. Pryor, has probably been doing it for at least two decades. Um, and a lot of theirs were around international law and arbitration prior. And so they, they focused on that where it was low margin work, so they wanted to be able to make money while, yeah. while they were sleeping. Yeah. And that's what they did. Question, please. So I was one of those unicorns who graduated law school and went directly in-house, but I was also uh, the secretary before that with the, um, I, I think he started practicing in like 46. Uh -huh. You were advanced technology. Yeah, I was, yeah, advanced <laughs> technology. Um, but I was confused because I graduated, when I graduated law school, I did not know how to practice law. I had to think like a lawyer. And it was, uh, so what can, law schools do today um, to prepare the graduates for this reality? Because I know a lot of my students in Suffolk... Take my uh, class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say take mine as well. Yeah. <laughs> in Suffolk, like Gabe's or enjoying Gabe's uh, lab. But uh, what can the law schools do to prepare for this? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so I'll start and then everyone can tell me that I'm wrong or right. <laughs> so, you know, I think that the first thing is acknowledge that it's a problem. And, and we have events like this, you know, my work at New York Law School, it, we acknowledge that we have a problem. The second is we need to think about the things that are missing from that legal education that you truly have to know on day one. And then more importantly, the things that you're not going to learn. So this is one woman's experience and, and may not be everyone's. Um, but I found that in working with, um, working at a firm, working with lawyers and, and working with others that practice, they can teach you how to practice law. Because I'm, I'm with you. I learned how to think like a lawyer. My, my brain got all shaped and it's different. But I didn't know how to actually practice in a way that someone would pay me to do that thing. So I, could, I sat with lawyers and I watched them and I you know, asked questions and some got answered and sometimes I got yelled at. But I learned things and could practice like a lawyer, but I still didn't have the business acumen. And frankly, and I'll, I'll be honest with this room, I only learned that through e-discovery because I wasn't well suited to be law firm. I was, I was other. And so I ended up working with a woman on the next panel, actually Janet Sullivan, who's in the back of the room, who taught me everything that I know about not just being a lawyer, but, but being a business person. And those elements are things that we just do not teach lawyers. I think probably your firm is doing that. Very few are. And so we need to pick those things. And as much as classes, uh, you know, like professors here, like mine, will teach you practical skills, we also need really basic classes that we're going to attend, like how to communicate with your client effectively, how to, the tones of your emails are really important, when to answer the phone and when not to, those sort of soft things. And I think we, we start there. So, um 
I, I will add to that. Uh, so we're looking for T-shaped professionals. I mean, I think a lot of people have heard that phrase, right, where, you know, knowledge is really a commodity, but skills is where it's at. And so we're looking for people that are coming in to our legal department with skills, whether that be an understanding of design thinking, whether that be taking a course with David Colarusso on doc assembly and expert systems, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that be understanding e-discovery or AI, it, you know, folks need to come with some basic technical understanding and even some skills around project management. I mean, another way to do it is, you know, uh, you can actually truly read Richard's book on tomorrow's lawyers and some of the alternative careers and the yeah. skills that are going to be needed into the future and start teaching those skills yeah. to folks coming out. Those students are valuable. I bring them in as externs. We hire them out as law clerks. We've hired them in because they've performed well. The other thing that they do is they light a fire under the lawyers in our department that aren't adopting those types of things. And they all of a sudden realize, wow, I need to go out and get these skills as well because these younger upstarts, they've got an advantage. We're almost out of time. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing I'd, I'd recommend is, you know, as a Canadian, I'm going to use a, you know, a bad uh, analogy here, which is go to where the puck, not where the puck is, but where it's the going. puck is going to be, right, where it's going. Um, so work with technology, work with industry, right? Look at the industry associations like ILTA. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, and partner up because um, I do this now. I work with several institutions around the globe on this to help them frame what do we think is happening in security, where is it going? And, and that, that, that applies to, to any technology in any academic field. Absolutely. Partner with Ulta, partner with Clock. They're yeah. building what they call like Law Firm 101, which is how to be a lawyer on a day one because we're not, get, we're not getting the commodity that we need day one. That's just basically it. And, and so either help build that commodity by partnering with those groups or help invent the new careers. So I, I, I would love to see more uh, in-house direct hires, but that also requires training, mentorship that we're used to seeing in the law firms. And uh, the secondments could be the upp opposite direction. But anyway... Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists very much. Thank you for your questions. It's been a great panel. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, we have another 15-minute uh, uh, break, and then we'll uh, be focusing a little bit more intensely on uh, civil procedure and uh, e-discovery. Uh, so feel free to take a bio break and uh, have another drink, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>